Christian nationalism. I, I love the yes. way that you've defined it uh, and just saying that there are, are technically six categories if we, if we look at you know the, the tribalism, nationalism, globalism on, on the one hand, and then over here, uh, Christian or not Christian. And you've kind of you know yeah. pieced in as a primary example, secularism, you know, hu- you know right. secular humanism. Um, right. uh, so, so if those are, you know, then, then we have six categories, Christian, you know, tribalism or secular tribalism and, and on and on, nationalism and globalism. Right. And when you put it like that, it's just like, okay, what, what Christian is not a Christian nationalist, right? right. You know, so it's like, so right. in that sense, I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian nationalist. I don't agree with everything with Wolf, and I know that you don't either, right? He's more Thomistic, right. um, whereas I always, you know, natural revelation, natural law, yes and amen. Um, but I also, you know, the, maybe it's the Van Til that in me, but I, I always want to remind people, but God wrote a book, and we, and we can yeah. use the book, you know, and so... So right. I, you know, so there's some distinctions there, but but I I really think that this Christian nationalism thing, if it's gonna have any, you know, it, call it mere Christendom, uh, call it whatever you want, but just the, the civil magistrate um, submits to Christ. No separation between Christ and state. Church and state is different right. than, and so yes and amen. The nations are Christ's inheritance. They must be Christian. And that's got to be a big tent. And so if some Thomists want to get on, uh, hop on with that, praise God, and we can have a debate later on. Um, so I'm grateful for uh, Stephen Wolf and talk to him offline some and, and grateful for what he's doing. But I feel like, um, and I know you're aware of this, it seems like there are some very, very large potential pitfalls. Guys want right. to, they want to make Christian nationalism. The guys who don't like it, they want to make it white Christian nationalism. They want to tie it in right. with, with the kinist. And you did a good job saying, you guys think that you're leading the charge, but you're the soft underbelly. Right. And, you, and, and, uh, and, and so what, what is your prediction um, in terms of what, what is, is Christian nationalism just going to blow up in our face? Is, are we all going to have egg on our face and regret using yeah. that title? What's going to happen in the next two, three, four, five years? Yeah. So, Supposing that it does blow up, and supposing that we do have egg on our face, those six options remain the six options. Right. Right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we get embarrassed or not. Those are the options. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what I'd like to do um, in response to this is sort of maybe shift the metaphor that we use on, on getting from here to there, because I think a lot of people freak out because they have the wrong metaphor running in their head. And then uh, talk about what I think the uh, challenge of kinism and things like that uh, present to us. So uh, when uh, conservatives, Burkean conservatives like myself, are suspicious of ideology, uh, an ideologue is someone who's got the whole thing mapped out and give them the plans, give them a flag and a direction to march and a gun to shoot, and he's going to go try to implement that ideology Mm -hmm. okay um the problem the the essential difference between a reformer and a revolutionary is patience Mm -hmm. a reformer is patient revolutionary is always impatient and revolutionaries are always ideologues Mm -hmm. but in order to abstain from ideology it's not necessary to have no idea where you're going or no idea of what the ideal society ought to be it's the presence of patience, not the absence of a plan. That's good. That's good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so here's the metaphor that I think a lot of people stumble over. We t- we're, let's say we're talking with different people about our ideal society. Mm-hmm. The temptation is to think that we're going into a restaurant and we're sitting down and ordering off the menu. Uh, and if I persuade my, hey, come on, let's get the steak, or come on, let's get the, um, let's get the pasta, or, and, and we think that when we order it, then it's going to come out of the kitchen hot and ready to go and be placed on the table in front of us, and everybody's talking as though Christian, a Christian nation is going to arrive straight out of the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, but we we have the challenging problem of getting from here to there. Right. And so I want to shift the metaphor. I want us to say we're not sitting at a table in a restaurant preparing to order off the menu. Rather, we're we're cooks in the kitchen standing around the pot and the pot is full of chicken curry. And the Lord has told us in the Great Commission that when we're done, he wants the pot to be full of beef stroganoff. Hmm. (laughs) Okay, 
now how uh, some miracles have to there have to be some remarkable things happen here in order for this to happen but when i'm looking at this and i let's say with the d various differences i've got with stephen wolf when i look at what he's talking about i'm asking myself is this a is this a step or two closer to be stroganoff right th than what we have now yes it is okay it it manifestly is all right, it's a step in the right direction. Now we can adjust sauces and we can adjust ingredients down the road, but this is a uh, this is a step in the right direction. And the other cooks standing around the pot, some of them want to put arsenic in the in it. So, <laughs> some of them want to uh, fill it up with water. You know, they've got all these competing things, and I'm saying no. I'm I'm with Stephen so far as it goes. This let's go this direction. What some of them okay. want to do is they want to say. Doug, um, if you weren't so racist, you would appreciate the curry. It's an ethnic yeah. <laughs> dish. You want the yeah. beef stroganoff because it's a white bland dish. <laughs> That's what yeah. they're going to say. Yeah. So I'm going to have to fix my metaphor. Yeah, you're going to have to fix curry. the metaphor. It's not going to work. I'm going to have to go, go from beef, beef stroganoff to, well, actually, I need to have beef stew like or Irish stew or something like that. Yeah, there you go. Something yeah. from the UK and we go to uh, go toward curry. Exactly. And then everyone everyone will see that I'm not a racist there you and go. they they will and they will apologize. Right. That's right. Um, so uh, having said that, that means that when you if I'm if I make a decision to go in the direction of what I think will result in a better society 150 years from now, th there really is room for discussion and debate there's also room for the unreasonable types to get in there and discuss and debate mm -hmm. okay and so we have to walk in wisdom and keep certain people away from the spices <laughs> right okay and uh and this is where it gets down to the practical um uh issues i i believe that we have to keep um three categories Kinnist adjacent, soft kinnist, and hard kinnist. Okay. Okay. Um, and a hard kinnist would be what in the popular par parlance is a racist. Mm -hmm. So a hard kinnist would be a racist. I don't like using the term racist. I used to um, until I, I spent a lot of time working through this. And I don't see race as a biblical category. Right. I see kin, tribes, languages, ethnicities that absolutely is a biblical category but race as in caucasian um asian uh, i don't see that as a biblical category that's that's something that we um talk to medical doctors or or um biologists about okay that we that's not <coughs> not a biblical category okay. so i want to talk in terms of ethnicity and and when it comes to ethnicity, the New Testament is filled with references to in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave free, um, and so on. Now, Stephen is absolutely right that the fall did not alter basic human relationships. Uh, it's not uh, Adam and Eve after the fall were still married. Mm -hmm. Again, they didn't have to get married again in a in a post lapsarian world. Right. They were married before. They're married after. Uh, the children that they have, if they had had unfallen children, the children would have been children, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, brought up and nursed by Adam and Eve, uh, nursed by Eve and brought up by Adam. Um, and after the fall, that's what happened. So natural relations at that level, like that are sort of a constant but idolatry because of the fall idolatry comes in okay so how do you uh how do you for example uh thread the needle that stephen wants us to thread and that i want to thread of respecting and honoring your natural relations out past your grandparents mm. okay uh your your clan your tribe Especially in an unfallen world where nobody's dying, mm -hmm. right. right? You can go visit your great 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 grandma, and uh, so you've got that situation. Um, that's one thing 
and I'm with Stephen completely in his definition of that. But in a fallen world, let's say you are trying to get from the curry to the stroganoff in a Confucian country mm. uh, where respect for your parents is all tied up with ancestor worship. Right. Okay. Um, you, and if you, if you suddenly decide, I'm not going to worship my ancestors anymore. Uh, and this was, uh, my mom was a missionary in Japan, and this was a big issue in Japan. If a young person converts to Christianity and stops worshiping ancestors, there is absolutely no way for that to register in any other way than disrespect for his parents. Hmm. Okay, so there, there's got to be a clash or a revolution or some sort of showdown uh, at this. There's a dis so when we're getting from curry to stroganoff in the kitchen, at some point there's going to be a fight, mm -hmm. right? At some right. point there's going to be persecution. At some point it's going to be disruptive, and that's why Jesus says, "Who you can't be my disciple if you love father, mother, wife, sister, brother, children more than me. You can't be my disciple." That and so that's a um, non-negotiable of Christian discipleship. Right, right. Amen. So I, I believe that the danger is because of the woke um, jihad, mm -hmm. where uh, people uh, people of my background, ethnic makeup, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, or middle class, um, or hillbilly elegy material, people people like that have been vilified for a few decades now yes, yes and because the church large the church at large the reformed evangelical church at large has gone limp on this mm -hmm. the people the people in that um category feel manifestly unprotected and they start listening to alternative voices who can give them an explanation for this treatment that they're getting and instruction on how to respond. Mm -hmm. And there are different shades of red pill, right? right, right. Uh, some deep, some red pills are really, really red, and some red pills are just slightly pink. Right. But there are, there are a lot of people who are now in a position where they are listening to kinists. And as much as I repudiate the kinist take, my foundational accusation for the existence of kinism lies with the soft left, the soft, woke, evangelical left. They're the ones who created this. Yes, 100%. Yep, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and we see that. I mean, we've seen that in real time with Thomas Accord, right, which was just a hit on Stephen Wolf, um, you know, and it's, and it's sad what happened to him. And yet at the same time, it's also, um, that's why we have to have self-control. Um, and, right. and just as a practical tip, um, one of the guys in my church, as we were talking about the situation, he said, it's a good time to remember that burner accounts are meant to eventually be burned. Um, you, you know, <laughs> you want to, you want to get rid of those from time to time. I, I'm not against the pseudonyms. I mean, we have a rich history, you know, w within yeah. the American tradition and, and beyond, you know, writing under a pseudonym, but it has bit quite a few, um, Christians in the, in the the butt. I think, I think of, you know, even Driscoll. Um, I think he went under the, the pseudonym William Wallace, the second and got in quite a bit of trouble. Um, but all that being said, um, you know, it's, it's this hit on, on Stephen Wolf, which by proxy, that's also a hit on Canon. And, and it usually right. comes ahead with, um, with Voldemort, you know, he who should not be named <laughs> yours, yours truly. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, so that, that's kind of the, the play, uh, but isn't it remarkable? And you, you mentioned this, and, and some other guys that I've been talking to, you know, who had a relationship with Thomas, you know, and um, talking to offline. They, they, you know, they they're not condoning uh, racism, but they are, you know, sympathetic and compassionate, um, and the the way that a, you know, right way that a Christian should be. And saying, isn't it remarkable how there's there's so much compassion for uh, sodomy, uh, but there's mm -hmm. zero compassion cool. for for um, you know kinism and racism right. and you know and and I, I think that uh right now that you're right i think the overton window is is moving i, I keep thinking about you particularly because um the overton window is moving in such a way some some things you know all of it in god's providence and some things um 
good and then something's bad it's it's you know a reaction an overreaction and and coming mm-hmm. out of spite and vengeance um, but if that, if this continues to happen, um, I, I think that you have a real potential of uh, b- being viewed as a moderate. You know that reasonable. You could be viewed as a reasonable evangelical uh, within the next you know five to ten years. So, uh, I know that, that's the kind of thing that makes me wake up screaming. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that keeps but, you up at night. But I've actually seen that. I've I've seen that uh, starting to develop, and yeah. and it, there's a certain area there's a certain respect in which i want that to be the case so um let's say things get somebody once said about an ethnic war uh there's one one thing about an ethnic war you don't have to pick sides uh the other side does that for you Mm -hmm. okay you you don't have basically the uh when things come down to the point you can't take your own personal opinions about whether any of this should have happened and then because of those opinions, walk through a part of a city that is dominated by uh, a group that is at war with people who look like you. Right. Um, you, you don't have that luxury. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you should have your own thought through opinions, but you should also be aware of what's going on in the world outside you. Mm-hmm. Now, I've wanted, to, I've wanted to position myself and conduct myself in such a way that when we if we ever get to the point where someone says, Hey, can we have peace? Can we have some peace talks? Okay. Mm -hmm. Who should we talk? Who should we talk to on the other side? I want to be the kind of person that they would say, Wilson is prepared to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Now being, being reasonable does should not mean being compromised, but there's a difference between combatants who are fire eaters who they, they all they want to do is fight and combatants who understand the principle and who, you know, I would say um, be the difference between Nathan Bedford Forrest and Robert E. Lee. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you, you've got, um, I, I want to be the sort of person that when peace is possible without compromise, I'm willing to talk about it because I haven't lost my temper. Right, right. right. Um, there are some people, especially in the aftermath of the Accord thing, some people online who just lost their temper, mm-hmm. and um, on and both people, on both sides, on both sides, yeah. And I don't think it. I don't think we're helping anything when we lose our tempers. Mm-hmm. All right, all right, all right. Stop twisting my arm. I know you want to hear the inside scoop. Here it is. The glorious vision of Right Response Ministries for the first half of next year, 2023. We have not one, not two, but three massive endeavors that we will accomplish by the grace of of God. The first you already know about. It's our Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference. This is selling out incredibly fast. By the time this commercial airs, you may not even be able to get a ticket. I, I, I really don't know. So don't waste another moment. Go to rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com to join us for the Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference next year. Now, this is where you come in. We need your help. Our next two endeavors are number one, a documentary style film, and number two, a brand new studio. Both of these things are seeking to accomplish one primary goal, which is excellent, high quality, glorious Christian media. We are tired of, of, as Christians, doing things poorly. We've done our best with what we have, but by God's grace, we want to do even better. This is not going to be just another video. This is not going to be a sermon or an interview or a podcast, but we're going to make a documentary style film. And we're going to be hiring Nathan Anderson, the director of On Earth As It Is In Heaven, a very, very successful post-millennialism documentary that's on Amazon and YouTube, came out a couple years ago. He's going to be flying in from Chile to help us direct this film. And our documentary is going to be on postmillennialism and theonomy, why it's biblically valid, why it's absolutely necessary, and why, by the grace of God, theonomy and postmillennialism are currently on the rise. So we're going to make this film, and we need your support. And not just this film, but we're going to make all of our videos and podcasting and everything we do here at Right Response Ministries better. 
We want to achieve the highest level of quality and Christian excellence that we possibly can. That's where the new studio comes in. This new film, our, our date that we're shooting for is that it would be complete and publicly available in May or June of 2023, next year. The studio, our goal is that it would be completely done in its construction and the equipment and the setup and the stage and everything by January, February of 2023 next year. We need your prayers. We need your encouragement. And for those of you who are willing to do so, we need your generous support. You can give towards these endeavors by going to rightresponseministries.com forward slash donate. Again, that's rightresponseministries.com forward slash donate. Thank you so much for all your help. God bless.